Hey everybody, I've been using the new Logic 10.7 for a few days now, and so I thought it would be time to do my official top five, worst five things about this update. We're gonna start with my top five, uh, because I think that uh, of the things that are new, there's a couple things which I was so happy for. Uh, the first thing would be the MIDI routing. Uh, this is the functionality which allows us to go into any of our instrument tracks, choose an actual hardware port and MIDI channel. So that way we can route exactly from an external keyboard into that track and have that assigned in a more permanent way. This means I can have multiple keyboards, they all go to tracks, we don't have to worry about the mix uh, or the split MIDI, demix MIDI by channel function that we had to do in just the previous version. So our MIDI routing has finally caught up with every other DAW in the known universe. So really cool feature. As a side note, um, this was interesting. One of the choices is internal and remote. That's what you use if you're using the remote app or if you're using the typing keyboard. Uh, if you do a search in the actual documentation about this, there's, there's really not much listed. So kind of interesting, but just be aware that the minute you assign it to a, an actual specific thing, uh, say that I assign this to my keyboard right in front of me, and let's just put an instrument on here so we can hear this. If I open up my typing keyboard, that doesn't work anymore. They couldn't, I mean, I don't know why they couldn't just put the typing keyboard on any track, but uh, this way we can route it very specifically. So kind of a, a little nuance there. The next thing is the convert MIDI to pattern region. And if you've watched any of my recent videos, I was complaining about the drum pattern and how if we pull this up and it's a big MIDI file, then we can't do this convert to MIDI pattern, but I figured it out. And um, it was uh, actually more common sense than I thought it was going to be. Let me just uh, cut these up for you a little bit. So we're gonna cut up the originals. The problem being that the step sequencer isn't endless. So I was always just doing the default drummer. And um, the problem is, is that the default drummer region is longer than the pattern regions can handle with the step sequencer. There's a certain number of steps. So I can, if I were to you know, use smaller drummer regions, um, we can come through here and convert those into the pattern. And so you can see we can do multiple of the different sizes here. And um, so I can program all my stuff in the drummer, convert them over to pattern regions, and then do that. One of the biggest problems you see right there, the longer one cannot be converted. So if I'm cutting the drummer track up though, uh, you wanna make sure you're doing that earlier on because if you cut them up, it can actually change some of the, the things that are happening in the patterns in terms of fills and things like that. So you don't wanna necessarily do this later, but um, you could also, if we have this as MIDI, let's see right here, we're gonna just split. It should be the same data at that point. And now we can come through and convert that to a pattern region. So we have a lot of options. You just can't do one that's too long and the default drummer is too long. So work with shorter drummer regions if you wanna convert them to pattern ones. The next thing would be all the other enhancements inside the step sequencer. Mono mode, uh, the step record, the live record, uh, and then some of the key commands which allow us to create ties and things like that. Um, so that way we can uh, adjust our data without having to open additional lanes. So step sequencer, ever since it first uh, came out in GarageBand on iOS and then finally into Logic has been one of my favorite things that Apple's ever done. Uh, and I, I really like that they're continuing to make it better. Next thing would be the new sounds. Over here, we can filter all the sound packs and, and see what we have going on. So we have the vintage drum machines. We can come through and see what we have, all the kit pieces and uh, different elements. I mean, there's a lot of new sounds, not a ton, but quite a bit. And so it's nice to be able to come through and see all of those and then see the producer packs as well and, and see kind of what they, you know, what 
things that they wanted to include in, in, in some of those sounds. But you don't have to use them the way the original people did. You get to actually uh, morph and mangle and do whatever you want with them. The last thing would be the spatial audio. It's not my first thing. In fact, I think most people who use Logic are not going to be using spatial audio, at least not right now. Um, because, I, you know, it's not like... So here's the problem. If I want to do a spatial audio mix, great. I'm going to upload it to Apple Music and people can stream it. But I can't very effectively listen to it in my car. Or I, if I want to put music on on my TV, I don't have an Atmos soundbar or Atmos system. Um, it's like I can listen to it in one place with the uh, Apple headphones. And so with the AirPods and Max and Pro and now the, the, the lesser one that does the head tracking stuff, it's great. You can put them in that place, but I can't do like an Atmos mix for a YouTube video or a YouTube um, presentation or release. It's like one place. And so until that expands, if it expands, you know, it, it's kind of limiting. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But so I think it's great that spatial audio got added. I just think that um, it's at least number five, if not lower on my list. So that brings me to the bad things. This part of the list is uh, the one that we always kind of dread hearing about. But uh, the first thing would be the buffer size switching, which is... Um, should have been a good thing, right? And it kind of is. I don't mind it to, to you know, s actually have to reload things. If I change my hardware device, it's going to have to reload the session a little bit. And in the past, a buffer size change would do the same thing. And now I can just change it and um, it just changes and everything's fine, right? So I can do that really easily. The problem is, on some of my existing sessions with a lot of plugins, some third-party plugins and things, um, it just changes, and then about 60 seconds later, the whole thing crashes. Uh, and so there's definitely some some stuff to work out around this. It's still reloading some of the plugins on some level, but it's like maintaining all the assets. And so because it's doing that, if the plugin has a little bit of an issue, it's just going to take down the whole system. And um, almost destroyed my headphones because at the same time it did that, it put just full on as loud as it possibly can be noise out through my headphones. And, and I'm ripping my headphones off trying to unplug them while I'm trying to, you know, get it to stop. And um, it wasn't pretty. I actually have a, a screen capture recording of this. I was in the middle of making a video at one point uh, in the last couple of days when it did that. And... Um, yeah, you'll, I should put that up there. <laughs> you can see my face and the sounds. It was pretty intense. Okay, patch merging. I do patch merging all the time. It's down here in our library uh, where I get to decide which elements um, I want to load up when I load up a preset. So if I want the MIDI effects to be loaded and the instrument, which is normally what I do, um, but I... And I'll often leave the auto effects, but I'll take off the sends. I hate it when I load up three instruments and I have all of a sudden six sends and attached to six aux tracks in my mixer. So I almost always turn that off. Well, now you'll see that those are deactivated. If I close my library and come back, they're still deactivated like that. But patch merging gets deactivated when I close the library, which means it doesn't actually do what it's not doing anything because it's deactivated. Uh, and there's no key command to activate this. So that means every time I open up the library, if I want to load something, I have to come down here, turn on patch merging, and then do it. Um, why can't we have a key command that just enables that instead of having to go down and, and mess with this on the screen? That's number two. That's a big one for me, probably not a big one for everybody else. Number three should probably be number one, but there's a ton of old stuff still lingering around. A lot of plugins with old interfaces, uh, a lot of tools that are still the same way. Um, so there's a lot that, that could have been updated that may have been more useful before Spatial Audio, but Spatial Audio is obviously on Apple's mind. And so they want to make sure that that gets out there and people can use their tool to do it. But it's like, come on, let's let's update some of the the things. 
um, that would have been really nice to have. Also, uh, there's a lot of uh, plugins which would be really nice to have access to uh, that other people are doing and other functionality out there that we just don't have yet. So there's a lot of old stuff lingering around. The next thing for me, I was still a little bit surprised that we're still defaulting to the balance knob on all of our tracks. I think everything should be a stereo pan by default. Um, and I don't know why they insist on still doing this with uh, the balance knob. Uh, so that's uh, kind of a small thing, but um, things like that. There's just these workflow things. And then the last number, the number five of the things I didn't like still was spatial audio. I know it was on my good list, but it's also on my bad list. And that's because uh, part of the thought process, I think, with this, even the new M1 Mac Mini that I'm using, which is really powerful. It's as powerful as some of the bigger computers before it. Uh, it has a hard time doing spatial audio. It's a lot to ask of it. And um, certainly they want you to get one of the new M1 Pro or M1 Max computers. And that's how this works. Just to be clear, you paid for Logic at some point. We're up to Logic 10.7. Uh, it's like we're almost, not quite, but almost a decade into these free updates. And yet the real thing that they're getting us to do is to buy new computers every time they release a huge new function thing that takes up a lot of processing. So a lot of you, if you're running on older computers, even if you update to the latest operating system, if you can, and then update to 10.7, you're going to have a hard time with spatial audio. It takes a lot of beef to do it and to, to do it well. Uh, and so be prepared if you want to do spatial audio at a high level with the big mix that uh, you're going to need one of the newer or older but very powerful computers to be able to run that. So um, again, I already kind of went off about spatial audio a little bit. I, I think it's cool, but how much are we going to be using it? I'm personally sticking with Ambisonics for now because uh, I do things on YouTube and uh, I want the option of being able to have full 360 uh, audio instead of just half of that, which is what Dolby Atmos does, just the top half. Uh, okay, what are your favorite things about the new update and what things did you not like about it? Put these in the comments. I want to hear from you about the things that uh, that you really like and didn't like through all of this. And um have a great week. We're going to do a live stream tomorrow morning. So anyone who's watching the video all the way to the very end, come back Friday morning. We're going to do a live stream and talk about some of this stuff again.